All right. Uh, welcome to two, 24 Hours of PASS, PASS Summit 2015 preview. Uh, we are excited you could join us today for Amit, uh, Bernadette, and Sir uh, Agoba's sessions. How to be Nigeria, uh, troubleshooting SQL performance on Azure uh, virtual machines. And this 24 Hours of PASS event consists of 24 consecutive live webcasts delivered by expert speakers from the PaaS community. And this session is a preview of one of the many technical sessions that will be presented at the PaaS Summit in October this year. Recording will be available in one week at www.24hoursofpaaS.com. My name is Ivan Chen, Senior Data Architect at the Connected Credit Union, Canada. And I have a few quick introductions introduction slides before I hand over to the speaker, Amit uh, Bernadette and Sarab uh, Agoba. And they will speak for 40 to 45 minutes, and then we will move on to the QA session where you can ask uh, them any questions you may have. So next slide. So if you have any questions or if you are experiencing any issues, just type your question in the uh, question panel on the GoToWebinar control panel and someone will assist you. Uh, feel free to enter your question in the QA field at any time. Once we got to the QA portion of the session, I will read off your question to the speaker. Since all the attendees are muted, you will need to submit question by typing in the QA session. Also, there will be a short evaluation at the end of the session. Your feedback is important to us, so please take a moment to complete it. It will appear in your web browser. So next slide. So here, um, 24 hours of pass would not be possible without the support and dedication of a sponsor. So, uh, they are the reason this event is available to you free of charge. I would like to take a moment to thank our presenting sponsors, Microsoft, Dell, Software, and Adara. In addition, I would like to uh, also uh, thank these uh, supporting sponsors for this event, HP, SQL Century, and uh, Pyramid Analytics. So move to the next, please. So next, I'd like to bring your attention to the upcoming PASS Summit, uh, taking place in Seattle, Washington from October 27th to the 30th, PASS Summit 2015. Um, we'll feature over 200 sessions with a world-class SQL Server expert. Planet and presented by the SQL uh, Server Community for the SQL Server Community, PASS Summit is a single hand uh, hand uh, handedly the largest gathering of a SQL Server and a BI prof uh, professionals in the world, with over 5,000 registrants from all over the world. Uh, PASS Summit is also a great place to network and meet face-to-face -face with expert peers and um, MOEPs. More importantly, PASS Summit delivers on providing you with the answers to your SQL Server issues, along with the knowledge strategy and the skills you need to stay ahead of the curve. Save 200 bucks uh, right now by using the discount code 24hopes15 when you register. Optimize your saving by registering before the end of the Sunday, September 20th. To find out more about PASS Summit, visit www.passsummit.com. Next slide. So make sure you explore everything PASS has to offer for data professional. You can join local user groups around the world, virtual chapter, find free online resources through our learning center, and read up on the latest community news in the Connector newsletter. For those interested in business analytics, check out the PASS Business Analytics Conference happening in May next year. Visit www passbaconference.com for more information or to subscribe to, to our uh, bi-weekly BA Insight newsletters. Okay, so next slide. 
So now, please allow me to present the speaker of the hour, Amit, mature, uh, manager, uh, manager, and uh, Sarab uh, Agowa. So, Amit, manager works as a senior program manager with the SQL Server product group at Microsoft. In the past, he was a senior primary field energy engineer at a Microsoft specializing in proactive and advisor assistance for SQL Server environment. In a previous role, he was also part of the SQL Server collection services team at Microsoft. Uh, this involved fixing, troubleshooting complex issues related to the SQL Server over a various range of environment. And next slide, please. And Sarab Agobas has over nine years of SQL experience and currently work as a senior primary field engineer at Microsoft specializing in proactive and advisory consulting assistance for the SQL Server and SQL on Azure environment. As part of the Microsoft Indian Services team, he has worked on SQL Server environment for leading corporations in various business domain, helping them to design, deploy, and support for mission and business critical applications. So we'll hand off to the speakers to giving them their presentations right now. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, so, so I haven't pretty much told uh, all of you what we do. Um, so Saab so works for Microsoft Services. I, I work for the uh, data platform group within Microsoft. So a lot of the SQL Server stuff that you see uh, out there today, uh, my team, uh, uh, works directly on that. So I'm just going to quickly uh, move to the next slide and uh, walk you through the agenda today. So this is a preview of what we're going to talk about uh, during our pre-conference session, which is a full day session at PASS. So today's agenda is uh, talking about the Azure Infrastructure as a Service, and this has been there for a while. Uh, why we're going to talk about this again is uh, Microsoft released a bunch of new recommendations for the SQL Server, virtu uh, SQL Server environments which are hosted on Azure and uh, those changes would be something that are updated and a bit different from what you knew earlier. So we'll help you unlearn some of that and uh, talk about the best practices that we recently published. Uh, we're going to give you a few cheat sheets so which means that if you're going to use Azure Virtual Machines for hosting SQL Server workloads the cheat sheets definitely help. That's what the cheat sheets are for. Um, and Sarb and I are going to go through a bunch of demos, which would essentially show you how not having best practices can affect the performance or drastically affect the performance of your SQL Server environment if it's hosted in Azure. And some of these best practices are not just for virtual machines hosted in Azure, but they pretty much apply to um, any kind of SQL Server deployment that you have, be it on-premises, be it in a virtualized environment, or in Azure. Now, this is a bit different. As I said, this is a preview session, but if you actually attend our pre-con session on October 27th, we're going to talk a lot more. Uh, we're going to talk about deployments, where we talk to you about how to move your workloads, how to analyze your workloads, how to directly transfer them uh, to Azure. For some workloads, we will actually show you how to transfer the workload to the cloud, which is the Azure virtual machine, without even having to type a single letter. Just a few clicks. Uh, we'll show you how to do workload discovery. Uh, essentially, that means that we'll show you uh, scripts which can analyze your environment and tell you what they map to in the Azure world. Uh, there's going to be migration deployment automation. We're going to show you templates, which could be helpful. Uh, we talk about best practices. These are something that we're going to cover today, but we're going to cover them in depth uh, during our pre-conference session uh, about storage, networking, uh, what do you need to know when you deploy uh, SQL and Azure VMs, and uh, how how they're different, and at the same time, how they're similar when you deploy a SQL Server instance on uh, on on-prem as opposed to an Azure virtual machine. 
from a troubleshooting perspective, this is pretty much the same. Um, troubleshooting requires you to remember that you're hosted on an Azure virtual machine, which means the way your storage, networking, and compute works is a bit different. But the troubleshooting concepts pretty much remain the same. So we're going to walk you through uh, pretty much uh, a major part of the day during our pre-con session is going to be all about troubleshooting SQL Server performance and performance troubleshooting as you know today for a SQL Server instance remains the same. What we're going to do, do for you on that day is we're going to show you what is the best way to troubleshoot SQL Server performance and at the same time utilize Azure features to help collect data and analyze it faster. And the tips and tricks that we show you on that day are pretty much applicable for your on-premise machines as well. So with that being said, um, welcome to the session. Uh, we're going to try and make you half a ninja or a quarter a ninja. Once you attend our session, you'll be a full ninja. So why Azure? So capital expenditure versus operational expenditure. And you must have heard this being in IT quite a bit. When you have capital expenditure, it's about owning your data centers, having your servers there, managing them, phasing them out, getting new hardware in. When you move into a cloud-based world, you don't need to worry about all of that because the hardware, maintenance of the hardware, refresh of the hardware is owned by someone else. All you need to do is pay for the compute and storage that you use and everything else, the hardware, which is hardware related, is handled by the vendor who is providing the cloud services. What we provide today is compute storage network memory, and we're only going to concentrate this session on our infrastructure as a service offering, which is the Azure virtual machines. So based on what kind of requirement you have, what kind of workload you want to host, you can choose a different compute and storage combination, and we're going to talk about what works best for SQL Server in a few minutes. Uh, also, you get a certain amount of network bandwidth associated with that. And based on the compute tier that you pick, you also get a certain amount of physical RAM associated with that. The beauty of all of this is because you're on a virtual platform and you're in a data center where we do not put a cap on the amount of RAM, disk, or compute power that you can use, you can pretty much scale up and scale down your hardware as and when you wish. Yes, the more you scale up, the cost goes higher, but there is no cap on whether you can scale up today or tomorrow. It's instantaneous. All you need to do is go into our management portal um, and change the settings. Yes, that requires a downtime for the uh, virtual machine configurations to be changed, but it's instantaneous. You don't need to have uh, uh, requisition forms. You don't need to uh, fill out long you don't need to follow a long process. You don't need to fill out any forms. All you need to do is open up the configuration properties of the virtual machine that you're interested in and scale it up and scale it down. Your virtual machine is on the go. What, what that essentially means is that it's connected to the network 24 bar 7. It's your choice whether you want to connect it to the public network or not. Uh, if you choose to do so, you can have your customers connect to it directly. If you don't want to do that, and if you want to only have a certain set of members within your team accessing that, you could do that as well. But because it's an Azure, you can pretty much log into that virtual machine from anywhere in the world. Whether you're sitting at your home or your office or you're traveling, as long as you have an internet connection, your virtual machine's practically available to you all the time. So what should you note? We changed our guidance for hosting SQL workloads uh, on Azure virtual machines as recent as la last week of August. So for SQL Server, uh, what the recent guidance change that has been is for, if you're hosting a SQL workload and Azure Virtual Machines, you should have a machine tier which is DS3 or higher for SQL Enterprise Edition. If you're hosting SQL Standard Edition, it should be DS2 or higher. And one of the very key things that we talk to customers uh, and we have seen this around the world, is there's a privilege called instant file initialization, which essentially lets you create a data file without zeroing, it, zeroing out the pages. And when you're restoring large database backups or you're auto-growing a file, not having this privilege 
can be detrimental to performance. If for some security reason you do not want to enable that feature because it does not zero out pages, uh, that's a choice that you make. But if you don't have any kind of restrictions uh, of that type, then you should enable instant file initialization, especially on Azure Virtual Machines. This makes a huge difference. In one of our demos, we're actually going to show this to you, where restoring a very small database backup actually takes a humongous amount of time without instant file initialization enabled. Uh, the way you get this privilege is you enable uh, perform volume maintenance tasks for the SQL Server service account. Uh, we've also released a large number of uh, SQL Server performance fixes. Uh, we always advise our customers to get to the latest build of SQL Server when they're deploying on Azure whether it's 2008 R2 or 2012, 2014, or even uh, the latest, if you're evaluating the latest SQL Server 2016 technology preview, then you should be using the latest bits for that. The reason for that is uh, we release uh, cumulative updates uh, at a cadence of every two months so to ensure that you have the latest fixes in there and you don't hit a known issue while you're running a production mission critical workload. It's always advisable to be on the latest build and have all the performance fixes. From a storage account, these are some non-negotiables um, based on our uh, work with customers that have hosted their SQL workloads in Azure VMs and what we have tested internally. Uh, if you have storage and compute requirements which are really high uh, and SQL is a resource-hungry process, you should be using P30 disks. These are premium I.O. disks. When you actually deploy SQL Server instances, what we say is have a separate disk for your log files because the log file I.O. is sequential in nature. Have a separate disk for your data files because it's random I.O. You don't want to mix the two. And that pretty much is the same for uh, hosting SQL workloads on Azure VMs. The only difference is Premium I.O. provides the highest tier of I.O. performance in Azure, and we are asking you to use those disks for your mission-critical workloads. Have one P30 disk for your log files. Have one P30 disk for your data files. Um, if you're using a machine tier which has uh, solid-state drives uh, attached as the temporary drive, you can use that for your TempDB. Now, this is something that is obvious, but the reason why we want to put this out there is because we've seen this not happen, and this has created severe performance problems. And what I'm talking about is having your storage account and compute co-located in the same region. You don't want to have your compute in a data center which is halfway across the world and your storage on the other half. You don't want them talking over the wire. You want all of them within the same data center, within the same region, co-located with each other where they can high five each other. And that's how the performance is going to be great. If you start co not co-locating -loc them and putting them in different geographies, they're not going to be able to high five and that's not good for performance. Uh, the C drive that you see is a strict no-no. Do not use that for any kind of hosting of any data files, backups, any kind of thing that you want to store should be in a separate data drive that you've attached to your virtual machine. The C drive is only meant for the operating system. It is not to be used for any SQL related activity, uh, be it backups, be it files that they need to read off, import, export, whatever. Uh, now this is something different again. We ask you to enable read caching on the premium IO disks uh, that are hosting the data files or the TempDB data file. And we have actually seen, based on our tests internally, that this actually helps performance. Striping gets better throughput uh, when you're actually writing out backups for large databases. You want to stripe them out. You also want to use storage spaces where necessary. Uh, storage spaces is a feature which uh, was introduced in Windows Server. And you can like basically club a bunch of disks together and create a storage pool, uh, which essentially means that you've got multiple data disks at the back end backing up that single volume that Windows sees and writing to that 
would be striped across multiple data disks, uh, which also improves performance. So these are a few things which you would not normally do uh, related to storage when you're hosting your SQL Server instance unless you over, your roles and responsibilities overlap with your storage admins, but pretty much you get the disk assigned to you and you go host your database files on there. But if it's on an Azure VM, you might have to do some of these storage related activities. So these are, this is information which is really good to know. So this is the cheat sheet that we're talking about. So use storage spaces, as I said, on Windows Server 2012 and above and use OS striping for Server 2008 or R2. Uh, there's a particular setting when you're using storage spaces called the column count. The column count essentially uh, targets the depth of I.O. that you could go to. If you're using more than eight data disks, then we suggest that you use the PowerShell commands published uh, on the Microsoft website to modify the column count to the appropriate number so that you don't get a surprise after you go live with your production workload. So when you use a premium storage disk, you get three types, uh, and they are varying disk sizes, and they have various uh, IOPS associated with them, and the throughput is also different. So more critical the workload, higher the amount of IOPS requirement than you would tend to a P30 disk, and which is pretty much what I mentioned uh, in my previous slide. And the performance that you get, the performance gain that you get uh, is vastly different. We wouldn't have time to run uh, a few hours of workload during this online session, but during our pre-conference session, we will have multiple demos available which will actually show you how you can move uh, workloads from just from a data disk which is not premium IO to a premium IO disk and, and see the huge difference in performance. So, some more tips on storage and the way and the reason why we keep harping on storage is because we've seen SQL performance issues on Azure VMs uh, for a lot of customers that we've worked with and at the end of the day it has come down to misconfiguration of storage. Uh, so we are talking about these points just to make sure that when you're deploying SQL Server and Azure VM you get the configuration of your storage right down to the letter on the first document itself. Right, so as I said, some of your virtual machines might have a SSC drive attached to it, so you wouldn't want to use that for any kind of storage other than buffer pool extensions in SQL Server 2014 and above, or the tempdb, because the temporary drive, as the name suggests, is temporary. So if your machine shuts down and comes back up, you will lose everything that's there on that drive. Not a good conversation to have if you put a production database on that drive. Separate data disks for your data and log files. And, and this has been something which has been out there for a long, long time. Everyone who is a DBA knows that. Do not mix data and log files on the same disk. Read caching, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, is recommended for your data and 10 DB drives. We have seen that, that health performance on premium IO disks. Uh, disable caching for the log drive because it's write heavy, so you don't want to enable caching on that. Geo replication. Implement disaster recovery through SQL Server features. Do not use geo-replication for your storage account, which is hosting SQL Server data files. The allocation unit size for all drives which are hosting SQL data or log files should be 64 KB. And this is, again, something which we document for on-premise environments as well. So this is not really different. But again, the not doing this has had a severe impact on performance uh, based on uh, some of the work that we have done for some of our customers. So I'm going to hand over the presentation now to Saurabh for him to continue showing a demo. Hey, thanks, Amit. Uh, so what, what we have over here is a, is a demo on performance TempDB performance, where uh, what I am using is two uh, Azure VMs, one configured to use uh, premium storage and the other configured to use standard storage. Right now, the the tests which we are doing here on the on the, on the TempDB is 
I'm creating a couple of tables, uh, as you can see from the Management Studio. The, it's the FAC reseller sales table, which is from the AdventureWorks database. We have extrapolated that table to have about seven or eight million odd records. Right? So I'm creating two tables. So one is the FAC reseller sales table and the FAC reseller sales table two. And I'm inserting data into the table using bulk insert from a text file. And at the end of the day, uh, we're creating a, some cluster indexes, which also you know, would happen or you know, goes to TempDB when you do an alter index rebuild or some kind of act, or activities like that. And then eventually, we are joining these two tables to return some records. Now, all of these activities are performing through a PowerShell command where we are creating uh, or you know, changing the TempDB location before each iteration and then running the tests on the TempDB. Now, before I get to the TempDB uh, actual execution, a couple of things to point out. So on, this, on the TempDB machine with uh, premium storage, what we have configured is, is a premium disk P10, which uh, is about 128 gigabytes of disk, which gives you approximately 100 MB of IO throughput, 100 MB per second. And then another drive we have is a premium disk P330, or P30, which uh, is a one terabyte disk, which gives you a 200 MB per second uh, throughput. There is a P20 uh, scaling tier, or tier in between, which is a 512 uh, gigabyte uh, hard disk, which gives about 150 odd uh, MBs per second throughput. On the second machine, what uh, I have is So on the second machine, what we have is a standard disk, which is the normal standard I.O. disk available with Azure. And then we have another disk, which I have configured as a storage space drive. Now, one of the things which Amit had uh, pointed out when he was talking through the, the slides was the column count. So in this case, what I have done is we have kept the column count to one, which essentially means the drive would give you a similar performance as a normal standard disk. In order to get more throughput out of your storage spaces, the column count needs to be varied accordingly. Now, behind this uh, storage space, we have two Azure data disks, the standard disks, which are each 100 gigabytes in size. Right. Now, getting back to the PowerShell script. So what we do over here is to change the you know, uh, drive or the TempDB drive and then execute the .SQL script, which I just ex uh, talked about. Right. The, the objective of the script is to simulate uh, inserts, you know, index creations, and uh, selects. As Amit pointed out, this is a very scaled down demo from what we would have for our pre-con in past, where we will try and showcase or try and you know, have a more extensive workload for TempDB and try and figure out, point out the differences you see with IO performance. Another thing to note about the standard disks is that we do not guarantee performances on standard disks because these are your multi-tenant disks where depending on the workload you have, the performance you might notice is varies between you know, uh, different time slots. But on the performance on the premium disk, Microsoft does guarantee some amount of uh, performance, fixed performance, which you will get. And from all our uh, testings, which we did before this session, we could see a fixed amount of uh, you know, time the entire workload takes. So for example, if you notice over here, uh, on the premium uh, IR drives, on the P10 drive, the entire workload runs in about 2 minutes and 15 seconds, while on the P30 drive, it runs about 2 minutes and 8 seconds, right? On the, on the standard drives, it takes about 2 minutes uh, 46 seconds or 2 minutes 45 seconds, depending on the disks we are using. And one of the things, as I had talked about in the beginning, was uh, configuring the column counts. 
since my storage space is configured with a column count of one, I do not see a major difference between your uh, standard disks and the storage space disks using uh, you know the standard uh, storage. The other last part of the uh, of the test is configuring TempDB on D drive, which is the temporary storage drive. Now, as Amit had pointed out during the the slide deck, uh, or you know when he was talking through the slide deck, that the best practice would be to use a P30 disks for your TempDB and your data files. But in cases where uh, P30 disks is not possible. An ideal choice would be to move the TempDB you know, files to the D drive. This, since the D drive is a temporary drive, care should be taken to recreate all folder structures when the VM reboots. Right. So what I'll do is I'll rerun these tests. It takes about two to three minutes for each of these tests to run, and we can you know check the response times again. And while these tests are, tests are running. What I'll do is we'll quickly talk about some of the other sto uh, SQL Server best practices which needs to be followed when we you know, deploy uh, SQL on Azure VMs. And some of those best practices would be, uh, Amit would be using uh, a demo on instant file initiali initialization and backup restore to drive the point as to how performance changes if, if best practices are not followed. Uh, so just give me a minute. Let me go back to the slide deck. Amit, if you could uh, change to the the storage the slide deck for SQL cheat sheet. Okay. So let me just go ahead and, and uh, present uh, my yeah. screen. So could you uh, make you should, yeah, you should be the presenter now. Okay. Try and hold that. Great. So let me bring up the slide deck. Right, so, and some of these things which you which is listed over here are also applicable to your SQL Server environments on prem, or and on a Hyper-V environment. Lock pages in memory, pretty much you know guarantees that you will not be paged out to the to the storage or to the page files on the system, and obviously improves performance. Disable auto shrink. Uh, every time the file needs to auto grow, there would be a cost associated with it, which would eventually uh, reflect in your response time for the queries. So we would, you know, so the best practice would be to suggest to disable auto shrink. Instant file initialization. Amit talked about it a bit in the beginning. A very very important, given that the storage on uh, Azure is is shared. Talking, I mean, it's multi-tenant instant file initialization or having to zero out the files before auto grow could could take a long time right so making sure that instant file initialization is present is is very important and amit would be doing a demo on the same thing where we would try and highlight what is the impact of not having instant file initialization using data rich page compression so that we can limit our io one of the things which probably you would have also realized by now is that the most important things thing when it comes to performance on Azure is about storage. And a lot of the best practices revolve around reducing your IO. Right. And using page compression is 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 one of the same things. It you know it ends up reducing your IO. Backup to Azure blobs rather than doing a backup on the local disk. Obviously, it eats up the, the bandwidth which you have allocated for the drives. So in a standard disk, so we talk about 500 IOPS per drive or per, per volume. If you end up configuring backups on the same volume as your data files, it would eat up, in, eat up your uh, bandwidth for the disks. Move all databases, including system databases, to data disks, which in ideal scenario would be a P30 drive, but for you know in in, in cases where P, uh, premium storage is not feasible, move it to an Azure Data Disks, and if possible, use storage spaces behind those volumes, and again move the SQL Server error log and trace file directories to the data disks. Trace files 
are very important because they end up uh, you know causing a lot of IO and uh, if, if they are on the OS drives which is the default installation drive it it would you know slow down the performance considerably right uh, so so that that's what about uh, from the from the storage or the sequels of a cheat sheet I'll go back to my uh, uh, you know the TempDB demo and then pass it on to Amit for the instant file initialization demo and the the backup and restore demo right Amit if you could just make me the presenter Thanks, Amit. So, my secondary monitor should be. Oops. Let me know if my screen is visible. Yeah, sorry, we can see the screen. Sure, thanks. So, yeah. Uh, as, as you can see, the, the the time which we saw for the the standard drives earlier pretty much remains the same. It's earlier you could see it was about two minutes and 45 seconds, which is still close to about two minutes 43 seconds, which in my current one again highlights the point that since it's a multi-tenant environment, you cannot always guarantee performance on a standard disk. Coming back to my premium drives you can see that the performance which we had earlier seen 2 minutes 15 seconds and 2 minutes 8 seconds pretty much remains the same for your uh, you know the premium IO disks right so uh, again highlighting the point premium IO disks gives you a predictable performance vis-a-vis -vis a standard IO disk as far as possible try and use a premium IO disk for your data files and log files. If premium IO disks are not possible, try and move your TempDB drives or TempDB files to the uh, temporary drive that is a D drive, which is an SSD drive. That's uh, So that's applicable only to TempDB files. Any system databases or user databases should not be moved to the temporary drive. Right, so uh, yeah, as you can see, the, the test on the storage space also completed, which pretty much goes back to the same time response which we had seen about two minutes forty odd seconds, right? And on the TempDB uh, on the SSD drive, it would be somewhere around two minutes and twenty five odd seconds. So a slightly better performance than the than the standard I/O disks, but a comparable performance with the premium storage drives. So yeah, that's uh, Amit. Uh, if, I'll, I'll, if you want to go ahead and proceed with your uh, instant file installation demos, I'll make you the presenter. Okay. So <coughs> while Sarah's making me the presenter, what what I'm going to show you is two demos. One is backing up um, how backups, if you do not follow best practices, can actually be a performance, can lead to a performance problem. And the second one is uh, the instant file initialization, which we've talked about uh, a few times right now. So the first thing that I want to show you is uh, two different commands. The first one that you see on, on the screen and, uh, is a backup command. So I'm just going to give it a few seconds before uh, the screen shows up for all of you. I want to so I, see the screen now. Okay, great. So I'm in a management studio window where I've got two backup commands for the AdventureWorks DW database. The first one is a backup to my G drive, which is a data disk uh, without any compression. And the second one is uh, backup to an Azure blob directly with compression. So I'm just going to run both of these and let's see how, how they perform. So. The first backup that I'm doing, and you can see that I have the stats printed at uh, for every 20%, nothing's showing up. And essentially, if you back up your database without using SQL Server compression, your backup performance is not going to be that great. Your throughput is not going to be that great. And if you're hosting a lot of databases on your SQL Server instance, 
And as you can see, this is the SQL Server instance that I'm connected to. So I've actually opened up ports, which allows me to connect to my SQL Server instance directly from Management Studio. Um, what you will essentially end up seeing is bad performance. And this can be avoided by doing some very basic things. You have a certain IOPS limit on the storage accounts that you use. You also have IOPS limits based on the type of storage that you're using, whether it's a standard data disk or the operating system disk, which you should never use for any backups, uh, or the premium IO disks. And all of these are essentially there because it's telling you that this is the highest range that you can achieve while doing backups or any other operations. So if you start writing your backups to that same disk which you're using for hosting database files, you would essentially end up eating up bandwidth from your disk. If you write into a data disk which is part of the same storage account which uses, uh, which is being used for some other database files, then you're eating up the bandwidth limit for your storage account. So essentially what I'm trying to say is do not back up your databases to disk data disks. Back them up directly to Bob Storage. And we have enabled features which allow you to directly back up and restore from Management Studio. You can set up maintenance tasks to do that. You can write PowerShell scripts to do that. You could even write T-SQL like the way I'm doing for this demo. And as you can see, uh, the backup is still running. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to Excel and I had run a few statistics uh, of, of previous backups that I had done. So the first one is a compressed backup that you see. If I look at the compressed backup, the average throughput that I get, uh, which is in um, MBPS, is pretty good. And this is the average out of 331 backups that I did. As opposed to an uncompressed backup, uh, the throughput is not that great. It's about 30. And this is for about 175 backups. And the time taken, the average time taken is also pretty high. This is in seconds. And the average time taken is about 45 on compressed backups. If I compress the backup and take it on the same data disk, which is in the same storage account as SQL files, the throughput is going to vary depending on how much uh, of a load your disks are currently handling. But if it's static, like non-business hours, you would still see that backing up directly to a URL um, that's an Azure blob actually has better performance. So I'm just going to move over to a graph that I created. And as you can see, the compressed backup to URL has the highest amount of throughput and takes the least amount of time. The more your disks get busy, the lesser your throughput is going to be if you back it up, even if it's using compression, backup compression, the throughput is going to be lesser if you back it up to a data disk. So bottom line, back it up to Azure Blob Storage. There is no excuse not to do that. So the next demo that I wanted to show was and as you can see, after about four minutes, it's at 40%. Uh, not that great. So I'm going to move over to my instant file initialization demo. So I actually have two trace flags enabled. Um, I have 3004, which will show me uh, messages in the SQL Server error log, which uh, essentially enables uh, logging for zeroing out of files. And 1806, which disables instant file initialization. So I have instant file initialization enabled for the SQL Server service account and using this trace flag uh, prevents me from using that privilege. So I'm just going to go ahead and start the demo. So let me go ahead and actually show you the non instant file initialization, uh, sorry, the demo which has instant file initialization enabled, you will see that I do not have trace flag 1806, which means that I'm going to be using the instant file initialization privilege that's been granted to the SQL Server service account. So let me just go ahead and run this. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm restoring a database backup 
And as you can see, that happened pretty quickly. So let's go ahead and inspect the output for a second. So the backup took about seven seconds, which is backup restore took about seven seconds, which is pretty good. And it was processing, it processed about 446 pages in 1.24 seconds. Um, the restore was done at 2.6 Mbps. Let's go look at the SQL Server error log and see if I can find any kind of zeroing out messages. So instant file initialization is not applicable for log files, so which is why you see the zeroing out messages of the log files. Uh, and it says it was completed. Now let's do the exact same thing. Now what I want all of you to remember is that it took seven seconds to do that. Let's see, without instant file initialization, how long this takes. So, execute. So, let's keep a watch on the counter, the timer there. Five seconds, six seconds, seven seconds, eight, ten, and we're still not done. So, let's go back and see how the backups are doing. So, the backup looks like it's still running. So. Essentially, I have a backup, and which is why I had actually preceded the backups. While we started the session, I had a SQL agent job running in the background because I did not want to have to wait for the backups to complete. So this essentially shows that if I am backing up to the data disk and if I'm not using the best practices that we have talked about, you could actually get into a situation which is avoidable very easily but once you get into that, it's not very pleasant in a production scenario. Now let's go back and look at the instant file initialization. Um, it's still running. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and look at the SQL Server error log and see if I can find any kind of zeroing out messages that were showing up in the uh, error log. So yeah, so uh, now you get to see the zeroing error message, and there it is. So you see zeroing out the MDF because I turned off the instant file initialization privilege using that trace flag. So now that I'm restoring the backups, I have to zero out the files, and that's what's taking time. And it's completed, so let's go look at the stats. Now it completed, so remember it was seven seconds, uh, even though the restore was going at a faster pace, it actually had to do a lot of work. So the time taken was 80 seconds. That's about 10 times more for very small database backup. And that is something that is avoided uh, very easily. All you need to do is enable instant file initialization unless you have a reason not to do that. So let's look at the details in the error log, so all it did was it zeroed out a single MDF file. So let's look at zeroing out the MDF files, which, which I showed you earlier. So let's search for the word zero in there. Find. So that's the G drive, zeroing out the MDF files. So there. It's the data files, zeroing out the data files. And that's all it did. And that took a 10 times more. Let's look at the backup. And notice that the perf, when it backed up that file, was at 9.8 megabytes per second. You probably want more throughput, especially when you're backing up production databases which are pretty large. And and this is a small machine. Uh, if you uh, deploy your SQL Server instances on large machines with high amount of computer network, you would see a good amount of throughput. And this is the throughput I was able to achieve. I was able to get to um, roughly 75 Mbps of throughput. And the backups for the same database completed about 36, 30, 5, 40 seconds, give or take. Uh, 
So in summary, what Saurabh and I were trying to show you is that if you don't follow best practices, which are pretty easy to implement, uh, some of these best practices are applicable for on-premise instances as well. But if you don't follow them on on-premises, the, the impact is not as high as what you would see as a performance degradation on virtual machines in Azure. The reason for that is we have documented them for a reason. We have seen customers get into serious performance problems by not following them. And the objective of the session was to give you a taste of what those were. Uh, during our pre-con session, I'm going to switch back to Management Studio and see if it's completed. Uh, yes, the backup's completed. It took 131 seconds as opposed to the previous one, which took 239. So as you can see, uh, the demo is right in front of you. Uh, we actually took the risk of running demos in a one-hour session. Uh, without following best practices, we've actually seen these not complete at times. So we're actually happy that it did. Uh, so it actually shows you comparison. So 239 seconds as opposed to 131, big difference. Uh, 10 times performance difference with instant file initialization enabled as opposed to not being enabled. And uh, Saab so so showed you his demos on the 10 DB. So there's a big amount of performance difference that you would see if you're following best practices versus not following them. I'm going to switch back to the slide deck uh, and cover the last slide. So uh, we talk about using lock pages in memory. Uh, this essentially prevents paging. Uh, we've seen this have a good impact on performance. Uh, auto shrink, this is you know something that's our we talked about. And the so to summarize, key takeaways, uh, storage plays a big part, and we just saw this saw this in all our demos. Uh, Sar was running most of his demos using PowerShell. We will have a lot more of that during our pre-con session. So PowerShell is really versatile when it comes to Azure Virtual Machines and SQL and Azure Virtual Machines. We will show you some true one-click scenarios with PowerShell uh, in our pre-con session. So, um, and we hope to see a lot of you back at our pre-con, uh, those of you attending. And templates, this is something that we did not show today, but all of these configurations, all of these best practices that we're talking about can be actually put into a template. If you have an organizational standard which needs to be implemented, you can create an Azure template for it, which can be deployed for each and every SQL Server deployment that you do on Azure. So it's as easy as that. And we're going to talk about that in uh, in uh, our pre-con session as well. So, do you feel like an apprentice yet? If not, then attend our pre-con session on, in October, and we will give you a full day of performance troubleshooting tips, deployment tips, uh, which pretty much works on any environment. If you're a SQL Server DBA and you want to know about deployment, performance troubleshooting, implementing uh, those performance best practices, attend our session and we will make it worth your while. So thank you everyone for attending our session. Um, we hope it was uh, useful and this is going to be available online. So we just opened up for questions now. All right. Thank you for Emmett and Sarah. Um, I have some questions from attendees, so I will probably ask some general questions and then uh, some uh, little bit uh, detailed questions. Sure. So first question, um, are those uh, cheat sheets available online? Yes, uh, most of it is available online uh, as part of the Azure documentation on MSTN and on the Azure portal, so it, it's there, yeah. Okay, and next question, um, so it's quite a little bit on the storage options. Uh, why those are different storage options based on Windows version, and is there any uh, dependency on SQL version? Uh, no. 
so there there are storage uh, limitations based on the scale of the vm which you choose so for example d series or a series machines cannot support uh, premium io right so that the, the differentiation is only based on the scale of the machine and not on the versions of sql or, or windows os okay um next question um it's about the performance of fix so regarding to the performance of fix as the best practice do we have separate hot fix for azure environment comparison with the primus environment this question is no so what we're doing is uh, we don't have a separate code base the code base that runs on SQL Server deployed on Azure and what runs on your on-premises is actually the same. So anything that we, these that you run in your on-premise data centers today is applicable in Azure Virtual Machines as well. Okay. So next question uh, for the data warehousing workload: Do you recommend lock page in memory setting? on the premise or Azure SQL Server environment? Yes, that is a, a recommendation for all SQL Server environments hosted on Azure Virtual Machines. Uh, this is done to prevent you getting paged out to the local disk uh, because the page file typically is hosted on a local disk attached to your virtual machine. Um, so that's a best practice that is applicable for virtual machines only. Uh, so, we we don't have any kind of uh, special recommendation for on-premise environments. Whatever guidance you see for lock pages and memory still applies, but for Azure Virtual Machines, this applies for any kind of workload. Okay, only one question left. Uh, why disabling caching on the log file drive? I, so I the reason for, you. Yeah, sure. Sorry, go ahead, Amit. Yeah. Go ahead, Amit. Okay. So the reason why we ask you to disable caching is because uh, the way the Azure disks are structured, and uh, we're going to talk about this a, a lot more in our pre-con sessions, and there's documentation available online as well. Uh, so read caching is preferred because it's a random read-heavy workload on your data disks. Whereas for your uh, log files, it's sequential write I.O., which does not benefit from any kind of caching because we're writing new stuff in there. So we have done tests. We have tested with customer workloads, and we have seen that having the caching turned off helps uh, on the uh, disk which you're hosting your log files. All right. So, so uh, this is the last question for the QA. Um, all right, uh, so thank you for attending How to Be Niger Troubleshooting SQL Performance on Azure Visual Machines. I would like to thank Amit and Nisarat for their time and their uh, expertise. Again, I would like to also thank our presenting uh, sponsors, Microsoft, Adero, and Dell Software, and our responding, uh, supporting sponsors, uh, Paramex Analytics, SQL Century, and HP. We hope you enjoyed this session as much as I did. Follow along on social media with uh, at past 24 hope and share your thoughts on the event with the um, hashtag number sign past 24 hope and the number sign sql pass. And stay tuned for our next session, building better SSS package with the team, Michelle, and happening in a few minutes. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Have a good day.